today I want to share uh, the news from the Elixir team. Uh, we are going to release the Elixir release candidate in the next days or so uh, for the next, so for Elixir 1.11. And that's going to be the focus of the presentation today. So what is coming in the next Elixir version, which we are going to have a release candidate really in the next three to five days. So, um, so for this release, I always like to show some numbers, right? So we have crossed more than 1,000 contributors and for the ecosystem as a whole, we, we are getting close to 12,000 packages and Hex has almost crossed uh, 2 billion downloads, which is quite amazing since at the beginning of the year, uh, it had just crossed uh, a billion. So for the Elixir features I want to talk about today, uh, there are other things. The change log always is already ready. So if you want to see everything, you can check the change log. I'm going to focus on five main points today. So uh, Erlang interop, uh, compile time checks, relation time improvements, config slash runtime, and some of our new APIs. So let's get started. So Erlang interop. So in, we have always valued Erlang interoperability a lot, and uh, in the um, but you know Erlang continues evolving, and we have every time Erlang releases a new feature, we find the best way to adapt and integrate with that new feature. So uh, and this is what we're going to talk about. So one of the examples I want to talk about is the logger. So Erlang twenty one added uh, a new logger, and the previous Elixir release already started integrating to it. So basically we integrated such that now when you log a message, the pipeline the message goes through is the same, both for Erlang and Elixir. And now we are really uh, adding all the features that have been made possible thanks to Erlang Logger. So uh, now from Elixir's Logger, we get four new log levels and they are mapping to all of the Erlang levels right now. So we got notice, critical alert and emergency. And those map after syslog. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically having compatibility uh, with Erlang. There is only one caveat here is that if you're using the Elixir backends for logging, uh, they are going to report the existing log level. So, for example, if you use emergency, it's going to come out as error because of backwards compatibility. But if you're using Erlang uh, log handlers and so on, everything's going to come out as expected. So we have more work to do to, to improve our backends, but we are getting there. Uh, another improvement related to Logger is that now Elixir supports structured logging. So before it could only log strings, but now you can log uh, maps and keywords as well in case you prefer structured logging. Another great improvement that I'm really excited about, uh, and that's thanks to the Erlang OTP team work, is that uh, from Elixir 1.11, you'll be able to access Erlang documentation directly in the Elixir shell. So you can say H and give a Erlang module, and that's going to bring the documentation as long as you're running Erlang uh, 23 plus, and it has been compiled with docs. So this was uh, a work, the work was fully done by the Erlang OTP team. We just had to do some small changes so we could print it properly. And I also want to thank you uh, to thank the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation, uh, the documentation working group in particular for um, coordinating this effort. All right, that's it. So let's move to the next section. So um, the next Elixir version, we are getting more compile time checks. So we will, we will, we will see some code samples and uh, what exactly that means. So let's take this code, okay? Uh, let's take five seconds, look at this and can you see what is wrong with this code? Okay, so we are receiving a, a binary and we want to encode the binary with its length, okay? So the issue with this code is here, okay? And the issue is that uh, when you pass arguments to the binary constructor syntax, right? Um, it expects those arguments to be integers, but the variable being we know because of the guard is binary, we, go, we know because of byte size, we know that the variable bean is actually a binary. It's not an integer, we're expecting an integer. So if you write this code today, we are going to see a failure only at runtime. We're going to fail with bad arg, but not in Elixir 1.11. We added a compiler check, compiler check to binaries. So the solution would be for to fix this error, right, is to add the 
column column binary modifier to tell it's a binary. But uh, in Elixir 1.11, you don't have to wait for the runtime to fail. Uh, the compiler is going to tell you, right? So this, you know, this is the message that you're going to see. Uh, the contents of the message right now, it doesn't matter. Uh, Elixir developers are probably familiar at this point that our error messages, they are quite long because we want to be very descriptive and clear about what, what happened. But what the error message is saying is exactly this description I gave, right? So, you know, you're using the binary constructor syntax. That syntax expects things to be integer, but you gave a binary and that's not going to work. That's going to fail. So you, we can now know those things at uh, compilation time and not at runtime. Another check that we added uh, in, in the upcoming Alex version is related to maps and structs. So if you write this code today, if you say, you, so we are matching on the user struct. A struct has predefined fields, right? So if you write this code today, user.unknown field, this code is going to compile just fine with no warnings, okay? It, wouldn't, it would fail to compile if we were matching on the field uh, when you match on the struct if you're pattern matching on the field, right? But that's not the case here. But again, luckily with Elixir 1.11, uh, we are going to be tracking the struct usage throughout the function body. So you're going to get a really nice error messaging, error message. So, you know, uh, it's saying, hey, this field does not really exist. And that's because we know that user is, a, is this struct, right? And this struct does not have this field and so on. So another improvement. Another compiler check that we are adding uh, is related to application boundaries. So let's take a look at this code right now, right? So we say crypto strong rand bytes. So crypto is a module that comes with Erlang. This function exists and this argument's valid, right? So what is wrong with this code, okay? In order to answer what is wrong with this code, we need to, to ask, is the crypto application a dependency, right? Because the crypto application comes as part of the Erlang standard library. So by default, everything that is in the standard uh, Erlang standard library is available to Elixir developers, and we can just call it. The issue for is that if you assemble a release, the release only maintains the applications that you depend on. So if you assemble a release and did not depend on the crypto application, then this call is going to fail in your release in the code that is meant to run in production. Well, it would not fail anywhere else. So with Elixir, with the next Elixir version we're actually checking the application boundary. So you can only call modules that you depend on, that are in applications that you depend on. If you forget to depend on the crypto application, you are going to get another big error message saying, hey, you know, this is what you tried, uh, this is why it went wrong, and here are the, the different ways that you can fix it. Okay, so, uh, so this is going to help whenever you use something, an application from Elixir or Erlang standard libraries and do not depend on it. But this can also be really helpful in umbrella projects because in umbrella projects, you can sometimes call code from a sibling project that you do not depend on. And this is going to emit a, a warning and it's not going to let you do that. So yeah, so we have been, since the last release, we have been working on this infrastructure to have uh, compile time checks. Those are some of the checks that we have added uh, in, in this release and expect more checks and more integration in the next releases as well. So continue on the list of improvements. We, we did not only uh, made the compiler smarter, but we also made it faster. So we have some compilation time improvements I would like to talk about. So let's take this code here. I'm defining a module, okay? So imagine that def defining a module A and that's defined on file A, okay? And then we are calling a, a module B that is defined in some other file. It doesn't matter, some other file, okay? So in order for us to talk about compilation time improvements, we need to understand how Elixir tracks dependencies between files. Because when you change a file, Elixir says, sometimes you change a file and Elixir says, hey, I have to, rec to recompile six other files. In some very uh, absurd case, it says, you change a single file and it says, I have to compile a hundred other files, right? So why is that? Okay, so that's because Elixir tracks dependency between files. So for example, in this module A, if we call B to something in the module body, right, because we are defining module A, we say that this is a compile time dependency because we are depending, B, depending on B while we are compiling A, while we are defining A. Similarly, we say that import B is a compile time dependency, right, because we're importing the functions in B into that, uh, into that namespace, into that module. Um, 
However, if you have a function and you call B only inside a function, then that's a runtime dependency. And the difference between compile time and runtime, de runtime dependencies is that if B changes and it's a compile time dependency, then A needs to be recompiled. But if B changes and A has a runtime dependency on B, then A doesn't have to recompile. In Elixir, in the next Elixir version, we did one small change. And the change is that imports, they are no longer compile time dependencies, they are export dependencies. And what this means is that now, instead of A uh, recompiling whenever B changes, is that A is only going to recompile if B changes its public API. For example, it adds a new function or it removes a function. So this may look like a very small change, right? But the thing we need to, we need to have in mind is that those dependencies, they are transitive, right? So if I depend on B, at runtime, but B depends on C at compile time. Now A depends on C at compile time. Okay, so um, so the transitive dependencies make that whenever you have a compilation time dependency, it can really spread out in your graph. So removing the compile time dependencies, it's very productive. Okay, it's very helpful. So to show you some numbers of what you can expect, so uh, we can get the Hex project, the server. It's an open source project. So in Elixir 110, if I touch the user file, and it makes sense, like the user file, usually, you know, a lot of people are referring, a lot of parts of your uh, web app is, is referring to this user file. So if I change only this file and I compile, it says that it needs to recompile 89 other files. But with, in the new Elixir version, the same change, we just updated the Elixir, the same thing is going to compile only 15 other files. So this is a huge improvement. Uh, we also uh, added a bunch of visibility into what the compiler is doing as we're working on the changes. So now, uh, as you compile, you can get the, the time for compiling each individual file. So now makes it really easy for you to see what is slow. And we have this, this task called XREF graph, which shows the dependencies between all the files in the project. And we have added a bunch of new options and flags exactly to make it easier for everybody to, if something is slow for some reason, you can get to the bottom of it as fast as possible. All right, next topic, config slash runtime. Okay, so uh, since the beginning, since Elixir version one, we had this config slash config file. Okay, That's, this is where you configure your projects. And you can use to configure, regardless if you're running production with mix or releases, your configuration, whatever you put as configuration in here is going to be valid, right, for mix, release, and so on. But those config files, they have one big issue, which is that they are executed at compilation time, okay? So, so the issue with this is that sometimes, you know, you have to deploy software, and the value of a certain configuration, you only know at runtime after you deploy, when you're going to run in production, after everything is compiled. Okay, so, uh, so given this big limitation of being a compile time configuration, when we added releases to Elixir, we introduced a new configuration file called config slash releases. And it only works for releases, but it comes with the big benefit that it is runtime, right? It's boot time. So this is going to be, this new configuration file is executed in production right when you start the virtual machine. Okay, it's not compilation time. And uh, this new approach was really well received. So what we want to, but it shows that there is a gap, right? Because we have this config thing that is compile time. And it works for mixing releases, but we have this runtime thing that a lot of people are enjoying, but it only applies to releases. So the idea with config runtime is to close this gap. So now we have a runtime configuration that works both for mix and for releases, right? And it's runtime. And our goal is to eventually phase out the config slash releases, right? We want to have this unified approach, okay? So uh, what does that mean, right? What are the benefits? So first of all, because it's no longer comp compile time thing. So for example, if we change config.exs uh, today, it has to recompile the whole project because it's a compile time configuration. But that's not necessary with config runtime, okay? Uh, your config runtime can rely on application code. You have to be careful, right? Because your application has not been started yet, right? Because you have to configure before you start. But if you have to, it can rely on application code. Sometimes people, they want to have some quick, small helpers to help uh, parsing some external configuration or some file that is on disk and so on. So now you can do that as well. Um, 
One thing to note in Config Runtime is that because it's meant to work both for mix and for releases, when you have a release, uh, mix is not available. So you cannot do things like mix env inside Config Runtime. So we introduce new helpers like config env and config target. So your configuration files can now be decoupled from mix and can only can exist on its own term. And our hope is exactly that it will become the main source of configuration in the long term. All right, so those are the main improvements that are coming in the next Elixir version. I want to quickly go through some new APIs that I think are worth talking about. So uh, we have added new guards. So we have uh, the is struct and is exception guards. You can now also do map.field access in guards as well. And those are all improvements thanks to uh, the more recent uh, Erlang OTP versions. We also added calendar STRF time. So STRF time is, means string format time. So this is date and time formatting. So uh, you can give it a date or a date time. You can give a string format and it's going to output that. Uh, this name is a little bit weird, but that's because we follow the STRF time uh, standard that was specified by Unix and C. So it's the same standard. Um, so if you are depending on a, on a dependency only for doing the formatting, um, then now you no longer need to do that. It's going to be part, it's, it's part of the standard library. We have, we, and over the last releases, uh, we have always added improvements to our calendar standard library. So our date, time, um, date, time modules. So we added a bunch of those in this release as well. So for example, beginning of month, end of week, so you can give uh, a date and say, hey, uh, give me the beginning of the month for this particular date and uh, conversion from and to Gregorian seconds to almost all of our types and so on. And we have also added a new task called mix test coverage. And in the last Elixir version, we added partition tests and partition tests is, so for example, if for some reason you cannot run your test concurrently, for example, you're, you're talking to like a MySQL database that does not really support concurrent tests well. Um, you, what you can do in the previous Elixir version, we added the functionality for you to partition your test. So you can run on four different processes. Or if you are on CI, you can have like four different machines running the, your tests and reduce the, the, the time to, to test the whole system. So, um, but this introduced an issue, right? Because if you partition your tests, your coverage is going to be partitioned as well because each machine is running only a part of your tests. So mixed test coverage it can, can aggregate all the coverage results if you partition your tests. So that's what this task is about. And it can also be used to aggregate coverage results in an umbrella project as well. So if you have an umbrella project, you can only have the coverage for each individual application. But if for some reason you want to track everything together, this task is also going to allow you to do it. So that's it. Uh, that's what I had to share. Well, we have uh, more uh, features coming in the next Elixir version. Those are the main ones. So I invite everybody to check the change log. And when we do release the release candidate, I really appreciate everyone who can test and give us feedback on those changes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Great, great update. Um, uh, we have one question um, from uh, Nicola Begedin. So around compile checks, so rumor is more improvements are coming. Should we update style guides now, or would you recommend we just take the benefits and wait for more? So my feedback about the, so our philosophy for the, compi uh, the, compil the compiler checks is that we, we want to infer things from the code without you having to do the work. So what can, it tell, can we tell you about your code without us having to change anything about your code? So that's our mindset. So my feedback is don't change your code. Write the code that you think is the most readable, the, the clearest to you and let us do the work of figuring out and being helpful to you. So, um, right, like, let's rule the machines, let's not let the machines rule us. <laughs> Thank you for the question.